Hello, everybody. So this is, uh, this is my wife, Leslie. Uh, I, I've been away from her for a few days now. Looking at her photo makes me happy. All these slides are under a CC BY license, so if you're missing your loved one, you can look at my wife, too. All these slides and the references, so nobody needs to take notes, are already up on slideshare.net slash cgreen, and you're welcome to download them and make use of them. Um, I do need to say that these slides are a big remix of slides from my colleagues. Many of them are here today, some are not, uh, but just to name a few, people like uh, Alec from CC Poland, uh, Kelsey from CC Africa, Nicole Allen, who's here from Spark, uh, David Wiley, TJ Bliss, a lot of folks are here, some are not, so I just thank them, and I've given them credit uh, in the slides as well. So I've been asked to do an impossible task, which is to summarize what's happening in the world for open educational resources in 20 minutes or less, so we'll do our best. Uh, re educational resources, as we all know, is all of the content that we, use, that we use in education to teach and learn. It's the textbooks, the syllabi, the videos, the games, et cetera. Open educational resources are a particular subset of those, as we all know, and there are two requirements for something to be an open educational resource. The first is that you must have free and unfettered access, free meaning no cost, and unfettered access, no paywalls, no logins and passwords required. Uh, and second is that we must have free copyright permissions. We must have the freedoms that flow with the work so that we can engage in what we call the five R activities, which I'll come to in a moment. And open is not the same as free, as we know. Free is assumed online on the internet. And because of the internet and our educational resources moving digital, these are what has happened to the costs of educational resources. It used to cost thousands of dollars for a copy. When we moved to the printing pass, prints, we moved to dollars per copy. Now we're literally in thousandths of a cent, or in some cases, tens of thousandths of a cent for a copy of digital works. And so as we talk about open educational resources, we say that open is greater than free, open is better than free, open is free plus the permissions, it's plus these five R permissions, the legal rights to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. We get to keep and own a copy, nobody may take that away from us. We can reuse a work exactly as it is. We can revise works to meet our own local needs, including making translations and local adjustments for the needs of our students in our countries. We can remix, take great works from all around the world and remix them into something new, and then we can redistribute and share those forward. So David Wiley, who originally coined the four R's, added the fifth, retain, and he says retain is fundamental because retain is a prerequisite to doing anything else. If you don't have a copy, if you can't continue to access the educational resource, forget about reuse and revising and remix, and he's absolutely right. And for those of you who have not yet seen this in your countries, watch out, it's coming. Uh, the traditional publishing models are moving toward models of increased artificial scarcity where they don't sell copies to your faculty or your students, they're leasing copies and they are uh, encumbered by digital rights management and time bombs and so the moment you stop paying for the resources you lose access. Uh, so this is something we need to be careful of. As we line this up, uh, and this is a slide from David Wiley where he says, look, what we have today with commercial educational resources is they're very expensive and we have no permissions. So we don't have the 5R permissions. You look at library sources, it's a bit better, but many of the library resources that we license don't own, we don't have the copyright to them, they're still restrictive reuse rights. And so they might be free to those students, to those faculty at that one educational institution, or maybe across the system, but they're not free to everyone else. And certainly I don't have the rights to revise, remix, and redistribute those resources. So we call it, those are not open either. Open educational resources, of course, allow us to do both. Uh, one other thing that we continue to see is, uh, I call it open washing, some call it FOPEN, uh, to borrow from, uh, from the French. Uh, but the idea here is that in the same way that the environmental move, uh, green movement uh, has been hijacked by, uh, by many companies that use green and pretty flowers uh, to mask oil spills and other things, there are entities in the commercial uh, space uh, and sometimes non-commercial spaces of educational resources which call things open that are not. 
Uh, probably the biggest example of that are many of the MOOCs that we've seen in the past several years. And so maybe they're free, maybe it's gated access, but in many cases, uh, the restrictions in their terms of conditions are actually stronger, more restrictive than all rights reserved copyright. At Creative Commons, we believe something different, and people from other organizations in this room believe something different. We believe that because digital educational resources can be shared at the marginal cost of zero with everybody in the planet, that we ought do so. And moreover, that as educators, we have a moral and ethical obligation to do so. Creative Commons licenses, as we all know, are the licenses that we use in OER, but we don't use all of the CC licenses. The two no derivatives licenses do not work in education. They violate every OER definition out there that's used, everything from Hewlett to UNESCO to OECD. And the reason is, is that teachers change stuff. If you tell a teacher, here's something, it's, you have to use it exactly as it is, nine times out of 10, they won't use it. They want to, they need to, they deserve to have the academic freedom to modify those resources. And so as educators, we do our best to stay away from the no derivatives licenses. Creative Commons puts the open in OER. That's one of our roles that we play. So what's happening around the world in OER? Well, more than we can do in my last 13 minutes and 48 seconds. And so rather than try to list all of them, I've opted to talk about a few of the trends that we've seen since the last Creative Commons Summit, which uh, tend to be accelerating, and I think this is all good news. The first trend is that we're seeing uh, global efforts, global discussions, global coordination and cooperation um, that we didn't see prior to the following two years. It was much more of a thousand flowers bloom. There's significantly more coordination. This is just one of many examples which I'll, I'll highlight. Uh, and there's a, there was an effort, continues to be an effort at oerstrategy.org to have a discussion about what does it look like to move OER into the mainstream? What are the things that need be done that we're not doing today? So if you're interested in this, that's the URL. If you're really interested, please do come to this session. It's on Friday tomorrow at 11 a.m. I believe it's, uh, it'll be in this building. So please join us. Another great example of coordinated effort is that uh, we've learned over the past decade that there are graduate students all around the world, master's students, PhD students, and sometimes bachelor's students looking for new majors who want to study open. They're studying open access, OER, Creative Commons licensing. Uh, they're working with Yokai and looking at new forms of commons economics, but they, they're alone. They didn't have a community to support them, and so the graduate OER, uh, the global OER graduate network is a place where they can not only meet other colleagues, but where they can get dissertation advisors. And many of us uh, who are uh, doctors in one field or another are actually serving on committees of those students. We're also seeing an acceleration in not just higher education or tertiary education, but also primary and secondary education. As you know, the OER movement primarily started in higher education institutions, in tertiary, around the world. We're seeing primary and secondary come roaring back in the past several years. Uh, one example is uh, Creative Commons New Zealand. Matt McGregor, are you here? Raise your hand. No. So somebody track down Matt later. Uh, and ask him about this. They are working with the schools because in New Zealand, the boards of trustees, not the teachers, own the copyright to what the teachers build. The teachers are work for hire. Creative Commons New Zealand is going in and helping the boards give permissions to the teachers to add Creative Commons licenses when the teachers choose to share. In the United Kingdom, also in K-12 or in primary and secondary education, there was a priori permission given to 84 community schools in the city of Leicester uh, to openly license their works and share them, not only across the United Kingdom, but with the world. And the school board went further and recommended Creative Commons attribution license be put on those works. Uh, CC Poland, which are here at the conference, if you want to learn more about this project, talk with them. Uh, they're working in primary education, releasing textbooks into Poland um, that are scheduled to save uh, the parents who formerly had to purchase textbooks for their students upwards of 25 million euros this year alone. And these books are also released under a CC BY license. In the United States, they're shifting to new academic standards around math, reading, and writing. It's called the Common Core. The estimates are that the 43 states plus DC plus the three US territories will spend over eight point two to 8.3 billion US dollars, that's billion with a B, to update the curriculum for two subjects, for 
primary and secondary education. Many of the states at this point, 12, and many from civil society have said no, that's not a proper way to spend public money. In fact, what we will do is completely change the procurement model and we, the states, will decide what we need, we will put out RFPs, requests for proposal to the free market, including to for-profit publishers. In fact, only really to for-profit publishers. To build what we want, but we, the public, will hold the copyright to what's built, and we will put a CC BY license on everything we build. That's called the K-12 OER Collaborative. Another trend that we've seen is called open, or in, in the case of education, open OER business models. Uh, one of the examples, which is one of the sponsors of, of the conference, is Lumen Learning. And what these folks are doing is focusing on the community colleges or the polytechnics in the United States. And they're helping schools that want to move to OER, not just with a few courses, but an entire degree program, or in some cases, entire departments, in some cases, entire systems of education. They're working with the Virginia system, for example. Move to open educational resources. And this, yes, it's a for-profit company, but they also license everything that they produce with a CC BY license, and they will not take a contract with a client that doesn't agree to collectively share everything that they produce. So we're seeing more and more businesses like this. Uh, my colleagues, Paul Stacy and Sarah Pearson. Paul's, Paul and Sarah, are you here? Raise your hand. Oh, they're parallel session. That's right. They're actually doing an open business model session. Uh, so they're launching, they launched a, a Kickstarter project you might have seen. It was funded. They're writing a book on open business models. And they will be providing not only case studies of who's creating businesses that are built upon Creative Commons licensed works, but they will be obviously openly licensing that book and sharing it. And we hope that that will drive forward the opportunity and models for others to also have open business models. In education, we're rapidly realizing that open content or the open educational resources themselves are important and we need to do that and we ought have all of the resources in primary and secondary education and certainly the highest 100 to 200 courses in tertiary or higher education as OER. But to be honest, that's low-hanging fruit and that's work that we should just do and be done with it so we can get on with the important work in education, which is moving to open pedagogy or open practice and open practices. What we're talking about here is we're asking the question, what does open allow me to do as an educator that I cannot do with closed resources? So one of the things that our colleague David Wiley talks about are disposable assignments. And the idea here is that when you walk into an e most educational uh, situations, you are given an assignment by the teacher or by the professor at the university, and it, I do the assignment, I get my grade, and then I, the student, throw away the assignment, and the professor throws away the assignment, and I move on. And that's highly unmotivating. Nobody likes doing them. The teachers don't like doing them. The teacher, I'm sorry, the students don't like doing them. The teachers hate grading them. And it's a waste of time and energy because we're not contributing to solving any of the problems of the day. And so when we move to OER, what faculty are starting to do, what teachers in primary and secondary are starting to do is they're realizing that the open license on the content gives them the freedom. It empowers them. It adds additional professionalism and academic freedom to their teaching and learning activities to let them design the assignments that they really want to assign. And so teachers are starting to say, your assignment for my class is to revise chapter two of the open textbook because in the field of biology, and that's the course that you're taking, intro to biology, there have been 10 new studies in the past 24 months and our textbook is out of date. As a student, you will read those studies, you will assess them, you will summarize them, you'll properly cite them, you'll update chapter two. And by the way, this book not only will be used by the rest of the students in our class, but the future cohorts of students coming through the class will use it. And I, your professor, will be at a biology conference next week and I'm gonna hold up this book and tell thousands of other biology professors that it's under an open license and they might wanna use it in their class as well. Which assignment would you rather have if you were a student? Which one is more meaningful? 
Last, we're seeing trends accelerate in the area of open licensing policy on open educational resources. By this, when we're talking about public funds, we mean that publicly funded resources should be openly licensed as default. So when you take optional discretionary grants from funders, be it governments or foundations or other entities, funders are starting to say, if you take this money, you must put such and such Creative Commons license on it. More and more, they're requiring a CC BY license. Uh, many of us in the room started an international project called the Open Policy Network. Many of the CC affiliates are part of the Open Policy Network. If you're not, and you like this idea of requiring open licensing on publicly funded resources, we invite you to join us. It's at openpolicynetwork.org. We have over 50 organizations from around the world, including Creative Commons, that are part of this. One of the projects of the Open Policy Network is called the Institute for Open Leadership. The idea of the Institute is that we, were, we are seeking emerging leaders, as Larry was referring to them, the new kids that are coming into the field. We're looking for those people who are up and coming in their organizations in open data, open science, open education, libraries, museums, open access, uh, any area of open is fair game. Uh, they have to come with a project to implement an open licensing policy of some sort at their institution. They have to have a letter of support, et cetera. So it's a fairly high bar to get in. But if you get in, it's an all-expenses-paid trip this year to Cape Town, where they will, their mentors will be many of the people in this room, and then they will be supported at no cost for an additional 12 months as they go back to their country, back to their institutions, and implement open policies. You can apply online at that address, and it's open for about another two weeks. We may extend it for a week. Some examples of open policies. The biggest open educational resources project right now uh, is in the United States. And the reason it's there is the US Department of Labor required a CC BY license on $2 billion of educational resources uh, for U.S. community colleges. They're building entire degree programs. Anything that's new or revised must be under a CC BY license. Uh, there was also, many of the people in this room worked on this project. Uh, we sent a letter, the address is sideways here, oerusa.org. We sent a letter to the President of the United States asking the President to consider a broad-reaching policy that would require that all federally funded resources that are education or informational resources that might be used for education, that they also be openly licensed. To support uh, all of these efforts, we also built a draft, and I want to emphasize it is draft, open licensing policy toolkit. This is really designed for and meant for the audience of of, uh, of government policymakers. Uh, it has already, I'm uh, grateful to say, been translated into Spanish. And if anybody else is interested in taking it and revising it, improving it, translating it in other languages, please do so. There's a CC blog post that looks like that. Uh, we're also seeing a focus in several countries, mainly in the US right now, on open textbooks. This is one chart that shows you why. And this really goes to Yokai's point earlier about taking this to the ground and looking at the data. Here's the data in the United States. If you look at all the full and part-time students in tertiary education, in higher education, it numbers up to 17.7 million. If you look at the average cost of textbook savings, be about $128 per course. That could, if, if there was just one open textbook adopted, of all the textbooks that those 17.7 million students in US higher education were taking, if one of those textbooks was an open textbook, the savings would be over 2.2 billion US dollars a year. These are the kinds of numbers that we're talking about. And this is the kind of analysis I believe that Yokai is encouraging us to do and then present and make the arguments for why open and the commons is a solution and frankly a better economic solution to what we have today. I'm going to skip over a few slides and highlight uh, something else that's hot off the press. Um, and our colleague Nicole Allen and others really helped to spearhead this. There's a new bill in the United States Congress called the Affordable, Affordable Textbook Act, which would create a competitive grant program to support the creation and use of open textbooks in colleges. We're also seeing, uh, last said here, increased research on OER. The research on open educational resources for development program is focusing on the global south, specifically South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. If you're not familiar with this project, please do take a look. 
Uh, in the UK, we've got the OER Research Hub. This, these folks are focusing on a particular set of hypotheses about open educational resources and then disproving or proving them. Uh, there's a hot off the press study, if you haven't seen it, recently published in Springer. Uh, this is 16,000 students across 10 institutions and some of the very quick highlights, course completion rates are going up when the courses move to OER, students' grades, their, their uh, success is going up and the number of courses they're taking and their credit load is going up. And then just to wrap this up, 11 peer-reviewed studies, 48,000 students, we're seeing 93% plus better outcomes, so this is actually how well they're doing in the courses. And as far as what people think about OER, the perceptions, 4,500 students and professors, and uh, 50 plus, we got 85% saying OER, we think it's of the same or better quality, only 15% saying worse. Thank you very much.